So hi and welcome to, um, again, our Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium's online, um, online classes, which are live. Uh, if you are joining us through Zoom, feel free to open the chat um, or use the Q&A at the bottom. Um, and if you're joining us through YouTube, uh, you can see it live there. Uh, today is a day in the life of a meteorologist with Chris Kurdak. So uh, with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to him. Hey, how's it going, everybody? My name is uh, Chris Kurdak, and I am a meteorologist and science educator here at the, well, not here, but at the Fairbanks Museum in St. Johnsbury. I'm here at my home office. Looks a little weird because I do the recording from here, so we've got some blankets over there. I've got my big uh, microphone set up over there. Um, but I'm going to kind of give you, everybody, a behind-the-scenes look about what goes on and uh, kind of the behind the scenes of what kind of gets done to show everybody to make a weather forecast. So right now I am going to share my screen and all right. So uh, we said a day, it's actually just an hour. So we're gonna do an hour on the life of a meteorologist um, with me who I just introduced myself. Um, so we're gonna first to make a forecast, you first need to know what. And I don't think we have too many people in our Zoom today, but if, um, I'll keep on going, but if anybody wants to ask um, some questions, throw them out there, or there might be some parts of the lesson where there's um, looking for some feedback from the listener. So if you guys wanna share, uh, that would be great. So to make a for forecast, you first need to know who or what you are forecasting for. So such as, maybe a baseball game, or maybe for transportation, or maybe for a day off. So, you know, we if I started talking about, you know, the winds in the upper atmosphere, and you were asking me about how your day off was going to go, you probably really wouldn't care about what the winds were doing in the upper atmosphere, because, well, you don't live in the upper atmosphere, you live on the surface of the earth. Whereas maybe if you were a pilot or you worked in the transportation sector, then maybe you really wouldn't care about the, the surface winds, or you probably would, but you maybe care about the surface winds in Boston where you were going, opposed to maybe where you're coming from. But you'd also be care, care about kind of the winds in the upper levels of the atmosphere, because obviously you're gonna be going up to the other, higher up in the troposphere. So therefore, you're gonna more care about that. And again, a baseball game, you know, you're going to worry about if there's rain or not is going to be your biggest concern, or if there's, you know, lightning or thunder, you're really not going to really worry too much about if it's going to be cloudy or sunny, because you can have a baseball game. And then a day off, well, I think everybody just wants sunshine on their day off. So um, that's something else you're looking for, maybe comfortable temperature. So before you make a forecast, you need to know who your customer is or who your client is and who you're actually making the forecast for. And again, if I started talking about you know, the, the wind speed at uh, 20,000 feet, you'd be like, what is this meteorologist doing? Or if I got on the, the news at the six o'clock news and started talking about that, you know, obviously the most people that watch the news or maybe listen to my forecast on VPR or the local stations in the Northeast Kingdom more care about the sensible weather. And that's usually what we talk about is the sensible weather. I don't usually talk about, hey, there's gonna be a few clouds between three and four but you definitely wanna know if it's gonna rain between three and four. So make sure you know who you're forecasting for to start off to make a forecast. And also what variables do you need to predict? And I know many of us kind of, we use this word variable often in math and often in science. And sometimes we lose kind of what that actual word means, um, but variable comes from the word vary, V-A-Y, which means something that changes. The opposite would be a constant so therefore, again, a variable is something that changes, but sometimes in science, when especially math, we talk about these variables, people think about just X and Y, but the variables actually mean something. So what var variables are we trying to predict here? Well, again, what variables pertain to weather? If anybody wants to throw down on chat or uh, participate in YouTube, maybe what variables pertain to weather or something that changes when it comes to the weather? <laughs> I think someone was saying, like, what's happening outside? <laughs> Absolutely. So, yep, that's where all the weather takes place. Thank you, Cooper. See if we got any more. Do we have many on YouTube? How, do you know how many viewers we have on? Yeah, 
they unfortunately disabled our chat. Um, so we're not able to see, we can just, there's a, a few people watching, but um, we're not able to answer their questions. Okay. Um, so we're gonna keep on going here then. And so, well, what variables pertain to weather? Temperature, high and low is usually what we often hear. Wind, clouds also pertain to weather. These are kind of not as big or, and then we have the precipitation side here. We have total amount of precipitation precipitation type. And if you live in Vermont, especially this time of year, you never know what type of precipitation it is going to be. Thunderstorms. But overall, what we usually care about the most, especially where we're kind of forecasting for the general public, is sensible weather. So, and I know everybody has seen this before, but something to kind of touch upon here is the scientific method. Um, and I, I think many of us have probably seen this before and being a scientist we kind of you know at the beginning of my day I, I don't kind of break out this piece of paper and say oh it's time to follow the scientific method but that's kind of the course I take on a daily basis first off is a question something I'm curious about and usually with my job it's well what's the weather going to be like today right so that's my first question and then I have a hypothesis maybe I looked at the weather yesterday or you know, so I kind of have an idea about what it is, but, and I might not do an experiment or make a plan to test my hypothesis in, in you know, I'm not really going outside and, you know, sometimes um, other places at the National Weather Service, they launch weather balloons, which are kind of a, in a type of an experiment as it's collecting data. And that's what you do in your experiment is kind of collect data. But usually I kind of skip over this one. I don't usually, you know, make too many experiments during the day, but what I usually do is I make a hypothesis is it going to be sunny? Is it going to be raining? Is it going to be cloudy? Is it going to be cold? But what mostly we do in, as meteorologists is we take a bunch of data and we kind of aggregate it, or we we take a lot of data and we kind of kind of use our intuition and our skills from what we've learned in the past to look at the data because the data is from the future, right? So it's not exactly going to be correct. And I think something that's really been um, in the topic of the news recently with the coronavirus has been. Uh, the, 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 the models that kind of collect the data with the coronavirus. And the models we use is kind of similar to those, those forecast models with the coronavirus about when is it going to plateau or when is it going to go back down. But again, that's kind of the same premise of the data we use for forecasting because all this data that we're using for the coronavirus is a forecast. And well, the data I use for the computer models is a, as well a forecast, but it might not be forecasting a pandemic. I'm forecasting weather. So I collect as much data as possible. I analyze it. So I, I draw kind of a conclusion to what I see or maybe what I've seen before. And all the data is not going to be the same. I have a lot of tools on my toolbox to use and collect. And again, just like the predictions with the coronavirus, you know, they're not going to be spot on. There's going to be some bias, you know, and some computer models might be a little bit more biased certain times of the year than others. So therefore, it's my job to analyze the data and draw a conclusion. And when I was a middle school teacher, while all of these steps are important, the most important step of the scientific process is report it. If I found a really big finding in my scientific method, I wouldn't just take the piece of paper and put it in the top draw of my desk and not tell anybody. I would report my findings to help all of society or better society, because that's kind of what scientists do as, as their job is we're here to work for the people at the end of the day. I'm here to give forecasts to people. So um, we're gonna get, dip right into it. So this is what we call the forecast funnel. And um, so on the right side here, we have time and the left time on the left side here, we have scale. So we start with the least amount of time at the top of our time period and our forecast funnel. So the hemispheric or maybe the planetary scale. So this is super large. As you can see, the cone is bigger at the top. So the biggest in area, this is kind of area and this is time, right? So um, the biggest area is the hemispheric or the planetary scale. And you don't take, you take probably the least amount of your time to kind of focus on this type of weather. So, and I'll give some examples. Um, going ahead. And then there's synoptic scale. So hemisphere, you know, like a hemisphere. So one half of the earth, or also known sometimes we call it the planetary scale. So the planet as a whole, the whole earth. And then we're going to go down a little bit to more synoptic scale. And overall synoptic scale is kind of like 
your bigger storms, kind of like the storm we have today over northern New England, or maybe uh, a nor'easter or hurricane, kind of those bigger low pressure systems or high pressure systems. And as you can see here in the forecast funnel, I spend a little bit um, more time here on the time pyramid and to find a little bit smaller area. And then the last is the meso scale, which is the smaller scale, um, is a smaller scale, which kind of um, is more like, you know, her uh, tornadoes or thunderstorms or more showery activity. And you spend most of your time on this, which is the smaller scale. And again, you could see that in the forecast funnel. I'm gonna keep on going here. And what do these scales represent? So the hemispheric or the planetary scale. So I've got a picture here or the global scale. And then the next one is the synoptic scale, which we talked about. And again, this is kind of the size of maybe a little smaller than a continent or, you know, we have a couple synoptic scale features right here. And then we have the mesoscale, which is smaller features. As you can see, it's maybe the size of a city or, you know, a big suburb or a metropolitan area. And again, mesoscale, usually what we talk about is thunderstorms or maybe tornadoes, but those smaller scales, right, within, you know, less than 50 miles or so. And then we have the micro scale. Micro scale is super small, almost to like a neighborhood even. We get a lot of micro scale features here in Northern Vermont, as we do have a bunch of different types of topography that lend to different types of like small scale weather. Sometimes we say maybe micro scale, you could say is maybe the top of uh, Mount Mansfield or maybe above a higher peak, right? Because they have a different climate or there's gonna be different weather not too far, 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 far higher up on Mount Mansfield, where once you get to the lower elevation on Mount Mansfield, it's more similar kind of the, the mesoscale or that the valley. So we get a lot of micro scale kind of weather patterns or kind of uh, here in parts of Northern Vermont. And I like this because this kind of illustrates kind of the, um, the scale. So this is by second. So again, it's kind of a weird measurement and on the bottom here we have, um, hold on one second, we have, oh, didn't mean to do that. Uh, I'm gonna, sorry about that guys. All right, so, and then over here we have more space, but as you can see at the top of this is, which is more of a, a planetary scale, it's climate variations, or this is Enzo, also known as El Nino, or maybe some cycles of climate. These are also different kind of isolations, um, I mean, teleconnections that kind of have to do with different temperatures or ocean currents and temperatures in the ocean or the MJO or interseasonal. Then we have planetary waves, which is kind of like the jet stream and then we get, so this is kind of all the planetary scale. This is the bigger scale. And again, usually what we talk about in uh, weather is mostly that the jet stream. In our continent, we have the northern jet stream and the southern jet stream. This time of year, mostly the northern jet stream. We just kind of call it the jet stream. And that's kind of more of the planetary scale because it's kind of this ribbon of fast moving air at the upper levels in the atmosphere that kind of circles the top of the planet. Hence, it's more of the planetary scale or the hemispheric scale. But once we get down here into the synoptic scale, this is more of your kind of everyday storm, like for instance, tropical cyclones, also known as hurricanes, tropical depressions. Also in there are kind of low pressure systems. Here in New England, we get nor'easter. So kind of those, you know, bigger weather makers. And I like to say this is in meters on the bottom, but I like to say between, you know, a thousand to maybe two to 3,000 miles. That's kind of the area we, we consider a synoptic scale. And then we get to the mesoscale, which I've talked about before. We kind of get thunderstorms or tornadoes or maybe different kind of temperatures and over different air piece spaces of area. And then we get the micro scale, which I talked about. You get the many um, in maybe more mountainous, uh, mountainous environments where it's a little bit more, the topography is a little bit more uneven as well as um, maybe turbulence up in the upper atmosphere, like you would see maybe on an airplane. If you ever gone through a little turbulence before, if it doesn't last too long, it's more of a micro scale feature. Sometimes you can get turbulence as well because of synoptic scale, I mean, planetary scale features such as a planetary, uh, such as the jet stream. So the turbulence can kind of go in all places there. So 
we're going to go over the main types of weather forecasting here, the, the kind of the, 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 the theories of weather forecasting. There's four main types. So the first is a persistence method, which maybe if you live in San Diego or Key West, this is utilized fairly often. Kind of what happened yesterday happens today. Here in Northern Vermont, it seems like we get two weather days in one, and you really don't use the persistence forecast method all too often here for this climate. We are considered a mid-latitude climate because we're in the mid-latitudes, and that's kind of where all the action happens, where the poles, and once you get to the equator, they still get a decent amount of weather, but it's not as transient and active as maybe the mid-latitudes. And here in northern Vermont, we're pretty much dead smack in between the North Pole and the equator. So therefore, we have a lot of different factors affecting our weather. So if I had to give any guidance, I sure would not use the persistence method if you were forecasting for most of New England or even most of this, most of the uh, United States until you get maybe more south towards those more, you know, maybe like San Diego where you don't get too much of a fluctuation in temperatures throughout the day or maybe Key West, you know, they obviously get rainstorms and thunderstorms, but their weather is fairly consistent throughout the year. The next is model trends or using math. Um, uh, so kind of seeing, this is not as used as well, as much as well, but kind of seeing what the trends were over the past, maybe a period of time and hopefully using that to kind of make your forecast for the future. The next one is climatology, which climatology means the normal per se, or the more long-term weather. So, which again, really wouldn't really work. Maybe it would work in Vermont in January. You know, if I said there was precipitation coming, you would only assume that it would be form of, in the form of snow here in Northern Vermont. Or maybe if we lived in South Florida, as well as San Diego, if I said precipitation was coming, your climatology kind of light would click on and be like, well, if I'm in San Diego or South Florida, I'm definitely not most likely going to expect snow. Where it's really tough to use the climatology method for this time of year in Vermont in spring, as we know, because you really don't know what the precipitation type is going to be. I could say, hey, we're going to get precipitation, but that could be sleet, that could be rain, that could be freezing rain. In our forecast today, it's raining pretty heavy here in northern Vermont, but northeastern Vermont is going to see some accumulating snow by tomorrow morning. So me just kind of saying climatology or precipitation really kind of leaves it out in the open here uh, for this time of year in northern Vermont. Again, if I said precipitation in July, I don't think you're expecting snow in July here. So you're going to assume it's rain. And um, analog method, I would say is more of an old school method. It's kind of uh, using, not really using the help of computers. So that's why it's called analog opposed to digital. And then the last, which is the most common and pretty much, again, 95 plus percent of um, meteorologists depend on numerical weather prediction or what we also call the weather models. And again, it's the most common. I am gonna pop this one uh, slide up here, kind of just to go over what we just talked about. So the persistence forecast, again, was one of the tools we use not too often for this climate. And again, today equals tomorrow. Um, uh, simply producing a forecast, if it was 87 and sunny yesterday, I sure wish it was 87 and sunny here today and tomorrow, but it won't be. Um, so pretty straightforward, I think. Well, the next one is the trends forecast. And this kind of, as you can see here, there's a low pressure system. And it kind of uses this as the fact that, hey, this went about 800 miles in 24 hours. So we're going to assume or predict that this next this next kind of area it's going to go through is going to continue going in the same direction. But we're going to add about another 800 miles or 24 hours. It'll be another 800 miles away. And that's where it gets it. Again, this is a little bit not as utilized as um, the numerical models. And then we have other forecasting models, which we talked about climatology. So for example, if you're using climatology, the method to predict the weather in New York City on the 4th of July, you'd go back through all the weather data for that day, the 4th of July, and take an average. So if it rained oh, you know, about a quarter of an inch that day over the last average 30 years, you're going to kind of predict that. And again, that's not really the best. Your, your forecast verification uh, rates will probably not be very high if you use 
kind of those past few methods, especially for places in the mid latitude, such as New York City. And this is a little bit more complicated, but the analog method, and again, um, for example, suppose today is very warm, but a cold front approaches your area. You remember similar weather conditions. So about a week ago, well, if the cold front came through, you're gonna assume it's colder. This is kind of hard. This is kind of like almost throwing the dart at the dartboard. So I wouldn't suggest if you were making a forecast to use this analog method, unless it was about 40 years ago, because that's kind of all we had to work with. But with advances in technology, as well as computer speeds, we've been able to use numerical model uh, prediction or numerical weather prediction, uses the power of computers to make a forecast, complex computers at that, there's rooms upon rooms for the, that host these servers that uh, help us make the weather predictions we do. Um, and it does, the one, there are some flaws with this and it does make a lot of assumptions. So we have to make a lot of assumptions. And I know I like using this, but I, computer models have been in the news recently in the same way the coronavirus uh, models, they make a lot of assumptions. So, you know, the, uh, the, the models for the virus have kind of come down for the fatality rate. Well, because the assumptions probably originally made in those models, and again, I'm not an entomologist, entomologist, but, you know, we're before the time of social distancing, we rapidly implemented social distancing. So therefore those computer models can make those assumptions. But there are a lot of assumptions to make because there's so many variables or so many pieces that change with the weather that you kind of have to assume some um, things remain constant so you, or some variables remain constant so therefore you can kind of hone in on what variable is changing. We do this very often when we do experiments, right? We also, also often have a control or a constant in experiments and we kind of, when we do an experiments in science, we only have one moving part or the variable that kind of helps us flush out the details about what we're honing in on. So you do have to make some assumptions with these weather models. Uh, one big assumption is, is that the atmosphere has a consistent density throughout all of it. That is one very big assumption we make in atmospheric science, which we know the density of the air changes as you go up and down, as well as there's different you know pieces of, of pressure going around. But we have to make these assumptions to at least sort out some of the variables that we're trying to hone in on. Um, this is flawed, and the method is flawed in the equation used by the models to simulate the atmosphere, and is not precise. This leads to some errors in prediction. There's also some gaps in initial data, since we do not receive weather observations over areas. So throughout the day, I think twice a day, each National Weather Service or certain National Weather Service services, services uh, launch balloons or weather balloons, and that helps us collect data in the upper atmosphere where we kind of don't have much data in the upper atmosphere. I know all of us can kind of go outside and collect data when it comes to sky cover or when we're on the surface, we know how much precipitation we received or the temperature or the winds, but we don't live in the upper atmosphere. Therefore, data is very light to come upon. So therefore we release these weather balloons throughout the day or the National Weather Service does. They're very expensive. So we can't really release a lot of them every day. That would be really great. And that would be helpful in, in kind of collecting more data and making more accurate, accurate forecasts. Um, despite the flaws, this, this method is best to about five days in the forecast. Um, and that's kind of been a big jump over the last couple of decades. The whole kind of um, about the, the periods we have a high verification or forecast has kind of expanded. So we've kind of made it about, oh, five to seven days where you can get a fairly accurate forecast after seven days or after five to seven days, we say that the, the chaos sets in and the computer models have a tough time kind of sorting out all this data because there's too much noise or there's too many variables changing for them to get a good lock on what is actually gonna happen. And again, I like, we use this term often as chaos is what we call it. So we're gonna pop back onto our PowerPoint here. And so where does all the weather ha active weather happen? And well, it happens along fronts. So often we talk about fronts um, in when you see, you know, hot H or L's on the on the, the screen when you watch the news. I don't really get to talk to screen so much because I am on the radio, but this was a good little website to help us here. Um, so what are the main types of fronts? And there's a cold front, 
a warm front, a stationary front, and an occluded front. And the cold front and the warm front are a little bit more straightforward than the other two, because if you have a cold front come through, you're going to expect the temperatures to fall behind it. Thunderstorms often develop along a cold front if the other conditions are right. And then the warm front, as you can see here, you'd expect warmer air to come in. So this is the direction of the front here we're going. We're going to look at the cold front first. And warm air has the tendency to rise, where colder air is denser, so therefore it sinks. So in a cold front, you have warm air rise up the cold air as the cold front comes through. And the cold air kind of takes over the warm air, therefore we call it a cold front. And again, this is usually where most of the action happens is along the cold fronts, or and they're usually attached to a low pressure system, which we will get to in a moment. Then we have a warm front, again, kind of pushes the cold air away and it is replaced by warm air. Usually you get some inclement weather along that front as well. The occluded front is a little bit more complicated. I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. Usually it goes hand in hand with a decaying or a kind of a fluttering out low pressure system. And it is a little bit more complicated as you do have kind of the warm air rising up and the cold air um, kind of still at the ground. And again, there's a lot more moving parts that it's not as straightforward. It's not as common as a cold front or a warm front. And the last is a stationary front. And we do see that especially this time of year. And a stationary front is kind of either a slow moving cold or a warm front, but there's really not much of an air mass change as you can see here. They're really kind of just hanging out or they're stationary. And usually you won't find a ton of you know super heavy precipitation during a, um, a stationary front, but you usually get some pretty stagnant temperatures over the course of a few days, as well as kind of that gloomy, not as nice weather, kind of that more of that consistent drizzly or consistently shower weather that you do um, sometimes this time of year. As we're gonna move on here, these are what we use to draw the symbols on a weather map. And again, the front formation for a cold front when cold air moves under the warm front, as you can see up here, it's moving under the warm air, um, which is less dense, which I already said, and pushes the warm air up and the cold front is formed. The, uh, the warm front, and again, what happens with the weather associated with it, frequent rain possible, thunderstorms, if the conditions are right, there has to be a lot of energy in the atmosphere and you have to have upward motions to help promote thunderstorms. Um, cooler temperatures and drier air after the front is very common. If you ever experience the thunderstorm, they often set up along a cold front. Usually it's a little breezy, but after the kind of thunderstorm comes through, you'll get some gusty winds, but it gets pretty quiet. But what happens the most after a thunderstorm is, is that it's often much cooler after the front comes through or the thunderstorm or the cold front comes through. So you're often noticing that there's some cooler temperatures. The warm front is when hot air pushes against cold air um, and a warm front is formed. Light rain, humid and moist conditions is usually what you would expect with a warm front. Um, and then the stationary front, air mass on either side of the boundary is not moving or is stationary or stagnant. And again, you kind of would expect cloudy and overcast, light showers, conditions to be pretty persistent and gloomy for the next few days. And then an occluded front is when a warm front overtakes a cold front. So it kind of like catches up with the cold front. The cold front usually moves a little bit slower, it becomes an occluded front. You sometimes can get severe storms. I don't like this website because you also can get some just kind of showery activity, kind of all dependent on how kind of where it is the low pressure system. And as you can see here, we've got our weather map here. And again, usually low occluded fronts are kind of you a below or just below a, a low pressure system. As you can see here, there's a warm front and there's a cold front and it's kind of catching up with that warm front with the occluded front and the stationary front. It's kind of just hanging out and producing some kind of gloomy and lackluster weather. I did have a quick YouTube video I wanted us to watch. I just have to set up my speakers right here. Give me one second, please. All right, I think this is very helpful for us 
This is kind of from a meteorologist view. Hold on one second. Get all this all the way up. I'm actually Elizabeth's mom's cousin. Can we hear that? And I work here at the Weather Channel. And uh, I hear you guys are learning Can about you hear that, so We're going to talk a couple of things about weather systems and fronts and kind of how those all come together to make weather. And then we'll talk a little bit about your forecast. So first off, we're going to talk about understanding what goes on in a weather map. So first, we've got cold air. And as it pushes further to the south, along the leading... And often we do live in the, the mid-latitude, so therefore we will get the cold air that comes from the north, the warm air comes from the south. Edge of where that cold air is advancing is where we would set up a cold front. And that's going to be this blue line here with all these triangles, and they point in the direction the cold front is moving. Now on the other side, we have a warm front. We have a mass of warm air moving northward. And as you expect, expect the warm air is coming from the south or in any direction, the leading edge of that warm air mass is where we draw this warm front, which is gonna be the little red line with the half circles. The best way to remember it is they're like little half suns, so they're always denoting warmer air. You kind of work it out that way, where sun, warmth, warm front, right like that. So that's how we denote where a warm front lays. Now, when we start moving and adding in things like pressure systems, we have a low pressure system right here. Air around a low pressure system moves counterclockwise and inward. So when we start putting those air masses around that air. So this is a very good point too. So this moves counterclockwise. So it depends on where, on what side of this low pressure system will you'll be getting warmer or colder air. So as it moves here, so sometimes the low pressure system is able to draw in colder northern air. So therefore, if you're kind of on this side, you'd expect some, maybe on, on this side, I'm sorry, you'd expect some kind of colder air. But as you can see here, on maybe the north or the eastern side, you're gonna get a little bit warmer air being able to kind of wrap around this low pressure. Area of low pressure, we begin to see just a few things happening here. The warm air surging northward, that's where the warm front is. The cold front surging southward, that's where we line up that cold front. And then we zoom in closer where we get all the precipitation. What's gonna happen here is you've got this air coming down from the north and this air kind of going towards the north and east, what happens is this piles up as it gets close to this warm air mass and it this so, cousin oh, uh -oh. and, and in down from the north. And so convergence means come together. So as you can see, all this air is coming together. So it can't really, there's not too much space for it to go. This air kind of going towards the north and east. What happens is this piles up as it gets close to this warm air mass and it starts to lift. So where these meet, all that wind meets we call that convergence, the meeting of air. And when it happens, it starts to go, it has nowhere to go, so it has to go up. And once that starts going up, that's where we start to get clouds and rain. And usually along the cold frontal side of a storm is where we'll see things like thunderstorms. But on the warm frontal side, over to the north, that's where we'll start to see just broad areas of rain. And so when we can see, actually see this convergence, because when thunderstorms form, they're cumulonimbus clouds, and you actually see these mantis clouds kind of rise up into the atmosphere. And those are the kind of that convergence or those rising motions. So the kind of air pinches together at the surface, and there's really not too many places for it to go other than up. And once it gets to a certain point in the atmosphere, it gets so saturated and it can't really go up any farther. So then it becomes wrung out and we get those thunderstorms. Showers and cloudiness. And as that comes through, all the weather gets a little bit cooler. Now, high pressure, a little bit different. High pressure systems, air goes clockwise and outwards from an area of high pressure. So why don't we ever see any rain or anything near an area of high pressure? When we have all of this air moving outwards, it's actually like if you were gonna turn the hose right on the ground, what happens is that water goes down and it spreads out. You don't have any lift, so you don't have anything to create that upflow of moisture to create any precipitation. So you and high pressure often brings nice weather. And as you can see, it spins in a clockwise motion. So usually in our, um, in, in New England, as the high pressure approaches or it builds into the area, it usually brings some colder temperatures. But as it kind of, if you're on kind of the, the, the northern side of it, or as it drifts off east, it actually brings warming, warmer temperatures. So the warmer temperature is able to kind of wrap around this like that as the mouse goes. So usually when you do see an area of high pressure, it brings nice weather. Say maybe, you know, 
you got three days of nice weather out of high pressure. The first day is likely to be the coldest. The middle day is going to be in the middle. But by the time that high pressure moves east or, or, your north, or north of that high pressure, it's able to wrap around and bring some warmer air. So usually you see the warmest temperatures with high pressure as it's departing or leaving the area. Usually when we talk about high pressure, we talk about nice weather. But let's take a look at what your forecast is looking like as we go through the next couple of days. So we're going to be looking at a little bit of rain. We've got a couple of fronts to the south. Here's our warm front. See the red with the half circles. That's going to come northward. And we're going to see a little bit of rain in eastern and central North Carolina. And also, as you can see here, it's bringing their southern air. Looks like funneling into here. Usually tropical air is moist, right? Or any air coming from the ocean is going to be moist than maybe continental or anything coming from the Arctic, which is more of a desert because it, you know, not a desert like you'd think, but it's very dry there. So it brings drier air or continental air. Where here, you're going to get that moist air. If you get moist air in the right dynamics, you're probably going to get some precipitation. As these low pressure systems and their cold fronts and warm fronts move along the eastern seaboard. Then by Wednesday, we'll see maybe a little bit of rain in Raleigh, but it quickly moves out and we start to see some high pressure move in. How do we know? Well, we don't see any weather going on here by Thursday. And that'll stay the same even as we head into Friday. Things kind of clear out, but the next weather system comes on in. We start to see some rain heading in portions of western Tennessee and portions. All of right. So as you can see, the high pressure was over here in the northern plains and it moved over here and brought the nice weather out east. All right, and now we're going to go back here. Oops, sorry, guys. Um, we're going to keep going along here. So let's take a deeper look at forecasting the weather. And I don't think we're going to spend too much time with this, but some of the tools we use is often put out by NOAA or the National Weather Service. Um, um, or the Na National Weather Service is a part of NOAA. NOAA is the National Oceanic uh, Atmospheric Administration. But this is actually a surface map. So this is a real-time surface map here, and this is put out daily by the Weather Prediction Center by the National Weather Service. And it's got a lot going on, as you would expect probably about a spring weather, but we're not going to go too much over this, but you kind of can scroll over each slide here to show you what, what weather is happening. We use, this is actually in Zulu time, so it's 18Z. So what you need to do to convert it to our time is because we've no longer in daylight saving time, five hours you have to subtract. So if you subtract five hours, five from 18, that gets to 13, as well as if we subtract 12 to make for uh, regular time, that would be 1 p.m. So this is 1 p.m. right here. And as you can see here, we've got a low pressure system coming through. Uh, New England, and it's almost kind of an occluded front as well, as you can see here, as there's a warm front with a cold front catching up to it. But here in northern Vermont, we've had some warmer temperatures the last few days. Snow is in the forecast, so this kind of cold front is ushering in some colder air. And again, it is a pretty complicated surface map, so if you don't understand some of this, don't worry too much. But you can see this cold front is draped all the way across from the mid-Atlantic to the south. Behind that, there is some nice weather. As you can see here, there's high pressure over the northern plains. Therefore, you're going to get some, or the northern Rockies into the northern plains. It's going to be drifting this way. This is going to bring some nice weather as well. As we move into Friday, so our we're predominant wind here, the jet stream is the westerlies. So majority of our weather goes from west to east. And you're going to see kind of how this high pressure marches this way, low pressure marches that way. And then by... We're going to keep on going here, and you can see this low pressure is working its way through the area, but it's also putting a cold front over northern New England, and you're going to see a lot of this green turn to blue because of it as this cold front brings some weather through. And again, we've got this piece of high pressure coming in, and then we're getting into Saturday here, or uh, late, late Friday night, and or Friday night, and then we're going to keep on going. As you can see, the high pressure finally made it out here. But we do kind of have a, a warm, kind of a weak kind of front this way as well. That is kind of how you read it. It is definitely a complicated weather map. You can also go here to the extended for extended days, and this is gets you to about this is uh, this is in the morning on on uh, Thursday here. So I'm sorry, the morning on on Sunday. Sorry about that. 
And as you can see here, it looks like we have another low pressure system coming on Monday. And it looks like a pretty robust low pressure system. So I'd expect to see some heavy precipitation Monday morning until later in the day. But that's kind of the surface maps. I am going to take us back here, though. And that kind of helps paint the picture of what the bigger picture of the weather is happening. Low pressure usually brings inclement weather. High pressure brings quiet weather. So we have some other resources here we can use for surface analysis, um, for long-term computer model, uh, long-term predictions, which is called the Climate Prediction Center, we call CPC. They give more of a month or a seasonal forecast. They're really not that accurate. Um, we have a way to forecast temperatures. This is put out by the Storm Prediction Center, and we can see right here, and this for focuses on more thunderstorms or storm activity. And they put out a daily, kind of a daily map here of um, where they think the highest potential for thunderstorms, tornado activity is happening. As you can see here, this part of uh, Southern Texas is in the enhanced area, as well as we know we have a low pressure system going through here where the mid-Atlantic states, there we saw that kind of trailing cold front on the map over there. I'm gonna go back this to this. Right here, we did see kind of a cold front coming through the mid-Atlantic states. And we said along cold fronts, you often see thunderstorms. And the, the, the prediction center is actually where I can find my tab there, is actually predicting thunderstorms in this area, as you would expect behind a, along a cold front. And then we have some other resources here. Always your great resource is your local weather service, is National Weather Service. Here we're in Burlington, as that's our local service. And as you can see here, they posted a winter storm warning for Essex County, as well as the winter storm, war uh, winter storm warning for parts of uh, northern uh, New Hampshire, and that's put out by the Gray Main National Weather Service Office. We have a winter advisory, a weather advisory for the kingdom, as well as Memorial County. But as you can see here, um, there's also some other tools to help forecasting. This is the, the current radar. This kind of shows you the intensity of precipitation as it's moving along. And which is a really cool tool we use here is the GOES. And it's a um, kind of shows you a picture or satellite of um, the Earth. It's very clear and it's a newer technology. As you can see here, it doesn't look like we're going to get out of the clouds anytime soon. But as you go down here to the south, you can see that it's pretty clear, but also what you can see here, which will happen very soon enough, but if you look to Western, maybe um, Western South Carolina, or maybe along Appalachia, you can see that the green up is starting in that part of the country as we are approaching spring. So, or maybe if we went maybe to other places, part of the country would probably be able to see some snow as well. See if we can find some snow on the goes. And this is kind of the world view right here. But again, you can see down here in the south or the deep south, it is a lot greener than it is by us. It's already starting to green up down there. So the one last tool I want us to use that we heavily depend on, and if you wanted to become an amateur forecaster at home, I would suggest this. And this is a free tool. And I'm not going to go too deep into it because you need kind of a little bit more than the time we have today to dig too deep into it. But this is the free website called Pivotal Weather. And this is kind of their main site here. And you kind of have to get used to kind of driving it or operating it. But if you go up here to models, there's also forecasts from the National Weather Service and current observations. There's a plethora of really great data to be had here, especially if you're kind of starting out to see to, with the weather. But, and there's, so this is kind of the behind the scenes of what we use as meteorologists to help predict the weather. And as I said earlier, there's a lot of variables that go into the weather. As you can see here on the left, there's um, conditions in the upper atmosphere, which we off, often look at. That would go at the top of the forecast funnel, more of the planetary scale. So upper conditions in the upper atmosphere or temperatures in the upper atmosphere. Um, but often we look at the surface we can look at surface precipitation and the type. And if we go over here to kind of forecast loop, this is the American model or the GFS. We kind of can see, and again, this is only a forecast, so this is not gonna be exactly what's going to happen. 
but you can see kind of what happens across the nation. We saw on our surface map earlier that we had high pressure in the middle of middle of the country, which we have right here, and we said it was going to move east. We also kind of have this cold front, which is not drawn on here, attached to the low pressure system that was supposed to create some thunderstorms in the mid-Atlantic states. Um, but as we also, if you've been looking at the weather, we've got some rain, but as you can see here, the blue means snow. So looks like we're going to have some snow in northern Vermont. Um, and again, I'm, I don't want to get too deep into this because there is a lot of kind of sciencey weather jargon here, and I don't want to overwhelm everybody. But so on the left tabs are kind of the variables. So of what you want to see, cloud cover. We can also go here and look at kind of surface temperatures. If we're at the surface, we can go to right here, temperatures at the ground level right there. And this will pop up temperatures here. Um, and you can kind of see what the temperatures will change as we go through the variable of time. And then also another point is, and this is kind of where you have to use your forecaster intuition. There's a plethora, if we go to this one here is the model, as you can see, it says model. There's a plethora of different models we can use and they're for different situations. This is more for a global scale, these models. And the GDPS is also known as the Canadian model, as well as the European model is this one. And those are the most accurate where the, the, the GFS has kind of fallen behind these models. These are smaller, shorter term models. And these are all also even shorter term models that are also helpful in predicting more small scale weather. But if we did want to kind of maybe just take a peek at what we thought about the weather in our area, I know we did see the National Weather Service um, talk about some snow. We saw some snow warnings on, on on their uh, their website. And we're actually gonna look at the precipitation. We're gonna use a short-term model here. But as you can see, we do have low pressure coming right through Northern New York and Northern Vermont. And as you move along, we're gonna get a cold front that comes through. And as you expect with a cold front and precipitation, we get this blue here, which means spring snow for some of us, which I, as much as I love snow, I prefer to keep it in my winter season. And we're gonna keep on going here, but it looks like we're gonna get some pretty showery activity through tomorrow, especially Northern Vermont. Looks like here, this is very elevation dependent. And if you have to kind of know your topography and your geography, this is the Champlain Valley here. Therefore, it will get a little bit warmer to, uh, uh, warmer as we work in a Sunday, Saturday. But again, but as we see here, it looks like we're gonna get some pretty showery um, precipitation after this big slug of precipitation comes through to today. One last part I would love to tell people about is we go back to the National Weather Service here, your local National Weather Service. Um, you could put your zip code in here. And if you are an amateur forecaster, or you just like meteorology and you kind of want to teach yourself to learn more, the best way to do it sometimes is just to hop right into it. And twice a day, the National Weather Service, so Again, ours is the Burlington areas, and this covers Northern New York and uh, most of Vermont, except for the two far Southern counties. Um, if you go down here to their main page, so weather.gov, and this is Burlington, Vermont slash BTV, you can go here and it's a little bit dry if you don't really know too much about the weather, but it's very helpful if you are aspiring to learn more about the weather. And you go here and it's called the forecasters discussion. And this is some pretty heady information that the forecasters at the Weather Service put out here. They give you a synopsis or the general overview of what the weather elements or the weather are going to happen. And then we get down here, they give the near term, which is about a 24 hour, 36 hour forecast. And then we go down even more. They give you a short term forecast, which is a few days after that. And then the long term forecast gets you about a week. But this is all very heady information about kind of what's happening in the atmosphere, what's happening at the surface. And this is put out by twice a day by very experienced forecasters at the National Weather Service. Um, so it's always great information to look. And once you actually read a lot, you would actually get to know the different personalities of the forecasters as they do list their last names about who wrote what. You might have some biases about who you might like as a forecaster more or less, but they're all really great forecasts they put out with a lot of really good information. If you want to learn more about the weather, you know, you're not interested in maybe taking an atmospheric science class or anything of that nature. I know we discussed a lot at the end of this PowerPoint here, um, 
But if you have any questions, you're free to reach out to us at the museum. It doesn't look like we have anybody in the Zoom chat at the moment, but um, I don't, if we have any questions on your end, Leela, or anything that you, we've seen today, more than welcome to ask. But other than that, I think I've given us as much of a crash course in the hour of a meteorologist as I can. Well, thank you so much, Chris. That was great. And it was definitely a lot of wonderful information, especially with the weather that we have coming up. I think having all access to all of these different models and websites uh, is, is incredibly helpful. Um, so thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, and again, uh, feel free to join us at 2.30. We'll have a um, planetarium. So really like the tonight's sky with Bobby for about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, in, in the near in the near future, and again, we'll have more classes starting tomorrow at 9:05. So, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you again, Chris, for all your information. That was wonderful. <laughs> have a great day, everybody. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye.